if we can move toward a more human-centered approach to designing and using technology, that this can provide some answers. Well, that's the task for our next panel to explore. Their role is to look at the emerging paths to responsible innovation. As the digital ecosystem continues to grow more complex, it's creating new regulatory and policy-making challenges. And just one simple example is the big platforms like Google and Facebook, as they start to enter the market, it raises that question of, well, who regulates them? Should they be regulated? Would it be the telecommunications minister, the finance minister, the central bank governor? We're having difficulty just keeping pace with the rapid way in which new technologies are coming to market. But given the rich richness of the innovation that we, we see, it raises this interesting question of surely we can harness all of this inventiveness and direct it in a responsible way. Can we not use this innovation toward empowerment and protection? What role can technology play to give us those tools in order to deliver solutions? I'm delighted to hand over to your moderator for this session, Jayshree Venkatesa. She's the director of the Responsible Finance Forums, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, Center for Financial Inclusion's Responsible Finance and Consumer Protection. Jayshree, over to you. Thank you, Stella. This has been such a great session and conversation so far with such active participation from the audience. It's been wonderful. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to the second panel at today's edition of the RFF, uh, titled Emerging Paths to Responsible Innovation. In the previous session, we spoke about the many risks uh, that can undo the potential that digitalization of financial services offers. Much of the potential in tech-driven financial services lies in its ability to innovate and deliver value to both consumers and businesses. And we all know that for markets to function well, we need a way to promote competition while protecting consumers, ensuring inclusion and the overall integrity and stability of financial systems. This is only possible when different actors collaborate and use technology as a tool um, for positive change. And in today's panel, we will explore a few examples to see how this has been done. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our stellar panelists for today. I'm delighted to have Sheila Senfuma, who heads the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator led by Consumers International. And we'll hear a little bit more about her work at the, at the, at the Accelerator in today's panel. Sheila's had a long career in digital financial services and has worked on cash-based transfers with World Food Program. We're also joined by Shelley Cross from the Alliance for Innovative, Re Innovative Regulation, who's worked on financial regulation for a decade and a half and has a varied portfolio with UK's financial regulator, the FCA. She was one of the founding members of the FCA's REG team and has been key in evolving the FCA's tech sprint model and creating an ecosystem for REG tech in the UK. And last but not the least, I'm delighted to introduce Ivo Yenik, a colleague from my CGAP days. Ivo has led CGAP's work on regulatory innovation, on crowdfunding and regulatory sandboxes in, in particular, um, and has led uh, capacity building for policymakers, regulation and supervision of digital financial services. Welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we proceed, I'd urge the audience to continue using the chat as you have for all the questions, thoughts, suggestions, observations that might occur to you as our panelists speak. And we will raise these at the end during the Q&A session, or like Stella said, in the LinkedIn group after the event. So Ivo, I'm going to start with you first. Um, in the previous panel, we spoke extensively about consumer outcomes and financial health. Um, and how do you, I think one of the questions was, you know, how do you pro uh, incentivize providers to think about financial health, which leads me to you and your work on regulatory sandboxes, because since the UK's FCA set up the first regulatory sandbox way back in 2015, I think over 50 countries now have set up uh, sandboxes, and we know that it's had a positive impact on the fintechs that participate. I think there's evidence that's emerging from recent BIS papers that uh, fintechs that have joined uh, sandboxes have, you know, get almost 15% more funding. We know that regulators like them because it obviously leads to greater regulatory compliance. But what is the re what is the uh, connection between regulatory sandboxes and the role that they play in improving consumer outcomes? What is the evidence that you can share with us? Thank you, Jashri, uh, for having me. Thank you, uh, RFF, for inviting me to share uh, some of the CGAP insights on this topic. And thanks for this uh, pretty complex question. Um, so 
before I get to what we actually know in terms of the evidence about how regulatory sandboxes are helping to improve customer outcomes, let me just first start sort of conceptually describing what are the avenues in which I think regulatory sandboxes can potentially help to improve customer outcomes. Um, the most obvious, I think, one is uh, by helping regulators to create a better framework that is conducive to beneficial innovation and do, it so, uh, do so faster. Um, through sandboxes, regulators engage in dialogue with the industry and they implement a small scale testing that informs their decision on how to respond to specific innovation. And that response can range really from doing nothing to uh, making a legislative change and anything in between. And as long as that response promotes innovation that generates better customer outcomes, we can attribute that result to regulatory sandbox. Now we can think of different examples like the remote onboarding of customers in Malaysia, uh, price comparison uh, websites or portal uh, for insurance in Singapore, equity crowdfunding in Kenya. All of these examples potentially led to or are leading to a better customer outcomes. The second avenue is by creating regulatory sandboxes that have a very specific, specific theme that is meant to promote a better customer outcomes, like better financial advice for customers, for example, or more affordable credit. Regulators do have the freedom to set up a sandbox that have that very specific theme and invite innovators who want to help to address that specific objective and promote better, better customer outcomes. So thematic sandboxes, set up around a specific topic. And then the third avenue is by testing hypotheses and, and customer um, hypotheses about customer outcomes and customer experiences during the sandbox testing. So again, regulators can design sandbox test in a way that it helps them to understand whether certain innovation is leading in, uh, to better customer outcomes and then monitor uh, the KPIs and, and the outcomes throughout the testing and based on the results decide whether they want to allow innovation to hit the market and scale up. So these are kind of the, 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 the theoretical avenues. We can also think of a fourth one because most regulatory sandboxes um, require providers, innovators to put a safeguards in place during the testing, like strengthen disclosures, uh, strengthen complaints handling mechanisms, remedy mechanisms, <clears throat> or compensation schemes. So those apply during the testing phase, but some of them can be then sort of reapplied and embedded in the regulatory framework to again, ensure better customer outcomes as the innovation uh, matures from the sandbox and, and, and scales up. Um, but you're asking about what we actually know in, in terms of quantitative evidence, uh, uh, what, what the impact of regulatory sandboxes is on the customer outcomes. And I think there is a big knowledge gap right there because as you rightly say, uh, said uh, the focus so far has been on the, the impact in terms of shortening the time it takes to bring innovation to the market, improved access to fund, funds by the startups and fintech companies operating in the sandbox. But we need to know more about how regulatory sandboxes are really advancing the stated objectives of sandbox, be it advancing uh, financial inclusion, promoting competition, or improving customer in experience and, and outcomes. And one way we can do it is by applying market monitoring tools that exist and, and, and are now being increasingly implemented by regulators to track the progress in terms of customer outcomes of those firms that successfully graduate from Sandbox and start scaling up and serving more customers. And CGAP has published actually a set of uh, tools, um, the whole toolkit uh, that is helping regulators generally to improve their market monitoring practices. And this toolkit can be specifically applied to, to regulatory sandbox to measure the impact in terms of outcomes. Yeah, no, thanks, Ivo. I think, I think it's, it's interesting how, uh, you know, in the first, in the last few years, we, we saw a lot of innovation focused on financial services and also to an extent, you know, regulatory tools and, now the conversation is slowly, you know, moving towards outcome measurement and what we need to, and you know, it's, it's a parallel that we saw in the previous uh, panel as well. So I'm I'm glad that you brought up the knowledge gap. It's it's work that we can all do as a community. Um, but moving to you, Shelley, uh, because you know, sandboxes is just one tool in a regulatory's in a regulator's toolkit. Um, you've been part of 
a team that's added much more to that toolkit. And in fact, you know, the first thought that comes to my mind when I think about tech sprints is I think of sweatshirts, I think of ping pong tables, I think about Silicon Valley's, um, Silicon Valley, you know, employees. So how did that, how did regulators come to think about tech sprints? And, and you know, fundamentally, how are first tech sprints different from sandboxes as a tool? Thank you, Jayshu. Yeah, um, it, it's quite interesting that you think of what pops into your mind is kind of the stereotypical hackathons and, you know, kind of, you know, a very specific image of, of people kind of all being the same. And, and, and that's actually the opposite of what we try to, to create with tech sprints, you know, diversity and, and not having a room full of, you know, of, of an echo chamber or full of the same people is actually the most important thing about tech sprints. Um, I'll just quickly um, talk a little bit about what a tech sprint is, because I, I, I throw this word around a lot and I think it's important to just quickly set out um, what they are. So, you know, the, the tech sprint is a regulatory tool that draws inspiration from the hackathon model. Um, their intense ideation or solution building events typically run over kind of three to five days, sometimes longer. Um, and, and as I say, the idea is to gather a, a really div diverse range group of people to collaborate on how technology and innovation can help solve what we used to call at the FCA kind of wicked industry problems, you know, those type of issues and problems that if you could solve them, they would benefit consumers, regulators, industry, um, and in actually, uh, you know, society as a whole. Um, and, you know, we're looking at things We've, we've spoken about it a lot today, inclusion and access, um, detecting and eradicating financial crime and fraud, um, eradicating corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So those big meaty um, issues that, that so many people around the globe are, are, are grappling with. And we know that the, the technology solutions are out there and we know there's nascent technology that's kind of untested um, or just coming through. Um, and existing solutions and it's you know the idea is if you apply that thoughtfully intentionally and with a human centric lens you could solve some of these problems um, you know some of the most difficult but prominent problems across the globe so but we also know that technologists and data scientists alone can't solve these problems in a room on their own so we gather subject matter experts academics financial services governments regulators you know big huge list of people um, to really look for new or better solutions so inclusive and diverse ideation to give you new perspective um, and actually addressing the issues not just that regulators or financial institutes their view of it but actually what the actual issues are um, and really how the application of technology, um, as well as highlighting some of the risks associated with the, the application of technology um, and, and really surfacing those. So that's, that's what tech sprints are and, and the FCA created them really as part of its toolkit. We already had the sandbox, um, but we fell and we, we went out and asked industry and, and they said the same is that we've got these convening powers that is very rare in industry. You know, we 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 can uh, gather new perspectives and draw attention to these industry problems. Um, and really, you know, the main difference between those sand between sandbox and tech sprints are that sandboxes are later stage solutions. So if someone comes to you with a with a you know proof of concept, maybe proof of value stage um, solution. And you move that through whereas tech sprints are really about surfacing new ideas and solutions um it's uh, about kind of having those conversations around uh, you know a, a problem and really you know get into the nub of what the issues are so trying to surface things that you may not be aware of or you may not have seen already um so you know that's kind of where it fit in our toolkit at the fca specifically yeah, and I, I like the idea of bringing in diversity and, you know, to very much the spirit of what we have or what we hope to achieve through the RFM. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Shelley, because, um, you know, it often one thinks about and because, you know, tech sprints and the sandboxes came out of the UK, which is, you know, much more advanced, has much more resources than emerging markets. Um, I'd like to understand you've done this it, through your work at AIR across you know, emerging markets. So 
what what are some of the positive outcomes that you've seen and are these transferable tools and when are they appropriate yeah so i mean i can talk a little bit about where they would apply um because i think you know when you're thinking about doing these you know if you have got limited results, why why do why do a tech sprint? What what do I what can I get from that? Um, so as I mentioned, their their ideation and design events at their heart, um, and there's always that goal that by you know the time we get to demo day and the teams are presenting um, to the judges that we want a, a working concept and that kind of thing. However, really, when you you sort of get to the heart of tech sprints and you look at the potential outcomes, um, you know, first of all, you've got the idea of creating an ecosystem around a problem so an ecosystem that might not yet exist um i mentioned earlier around fca's convening powers and and that was one of the key things there so you know convening the stakeholders around um a, a, a unique problem um central banks regulators often already work with ngos academics obviously financial institutions um, tech companies, fintechs, regtechs, et cetera, in some capacity. So, you know, that, as I say, they're in a unique position to kind of bring these people together. So it, the, the, sometimes the outcome is not necessarily the solution. And I think the other reason is it really shines a light on a particular problem that the, the regulator or the central bank actually wants people to focus on. So instead of, you know, releasing a, a, a white paper or you know creating a, a closed door round table by doing a, a tech sprint you can actually shine a light and say we really you know we really want someone to help us with this problem this is a huge problem you should be thinking about this all of you different people um and for example the recent women's economic empowerment tech sprint that air collaborated on in india with the reserve bank of india's um innovation hub you know, they were keen to shine a light on the barriers and challenges of women who were financially or digitally locked out, um, you know, really surfacing existing solutions, because it's it's something that people are already thinking about, you know, you don't go into this thinking that you're the first person to, to come up with the idea that we need to change. Um, but also creating a space to collaborate around new ideas so is there anything that we've missed are there any new technologies that are coming over the horizon that we might be able to apply to this problem um, and it also gave them an opportunity to kind of gather a panel of experts to talk about the challenges and, and that you know provoke that thought and hopefully action from a wide ranging audience around a particular problem um, and building that as part of a first step in a program of work which then kind of builds the foundations of an ecosystem it focuses you on what the issues are um, again as i say what the issues are and what they're you know not what they're perceived to be um, and surfaces some of those innovations and technologies that can be applied and i think as rbih have done they've made this first step um, they're following it up with an accelerator program um, and hopefully more grand challenges or tech sprints in the future to really expand on what their rich learnings and kind of grow the opportunities for financial technology in this space. And I think what we've seen in the UK as well as, as a result of tech sprints has been tech companies coming to us maybe months after the tech sprint and saying, hey, I saw the tech sprint, it was really, really great. And we was really inspired by the topic. So we looked at how we could pivot our solution to address this issue or projects springing up from large incumbent banks who have seen the potential for improving their own approaches to, in that space. Um, and there are almost these re residual outcomes that can have a, a, have an, a huge impact. And I guess it's like a, a ripple effect of if, if you tell someone that something's important, they might start focusing on that and you, you might kind of build more from that. So for me, it's really wider than just the solutions that are built, you know, sometimes over three days, you're not, no one really believes that you're going to solve corruption in three days with 100 people. Um, but the ripple effect of the tech sprint can be so wide reaching and really surface those innovative ways, create momentum, create motivation around kind of how an ecosystem can then foster innovation and, and move that on so um and of course it would be remiss for me not to mention that you know I've, I've talked a lot about fintech solutions but in many cases it might be tools for regulators or financial institutions so regtech or subtech tools um so you know 
we tend to get into the habit of, of making it sound like it's fintech, but you know, for some regulators, it's it's using their power of convenience to say, you know, what do how do we how can we do this better? You know, what sub tech tools or uh, reg tech tools are out there that can help us or that can help industry kind of improve our approach in these areas. Well, that's I I I love the idea of the ripple effect. Um, but I feel I've, I've structured this panel a little backwards. So we have later stage, which is reg sandboxes. And then we came to, um, you know, tech sprints, which is slightly early stage. But Sheila, really what's most important is the need to elevate the voice of the consumer, because that's where the problems arise. Um, and when we think of policy influence, we often think about markets and state, but we tend to forget the role of consumers and the voice of consumers in shaping more inclusive policies. Um, and of course, there are barriers, as your research with CGAP has indicated. Uh, you know, there's limited resources, there's limited capability to deal with DFS, but you have a unique initiative. So tell us what the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator is doing uh, in this space. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jayashree, and thanks to Zion for inviting us for this presentation. I'll just speak briefly about the Accelerator, which is a brand new, unique project that was launched by Consumers International in March. And uh, it's based on a needs assessment that we conducted together with CGAP in 2021 to respond to specific needs that consumers are facing in low and middle income countries. So the accelerator will be providing a platform to build bridges between consumers and uh, regulators in new and innovative ways. And it's been interesting to hear the work that um, that uh, Shelley and Ivo are working on because it fits into some of the things we want to do. And uh, the project is funded by the Gates Foundation and we're specifically designing for low and middle income countries. Uh, however, we do have over 100, uh, we represent consumers in over 100 countries and we do plan to have all the 200 member associations within our network be part of the project and the accelerator, but also inviting lots of other stakeholders to work with us to ensure that we do have a fair, safe and sustainable marketplace for consumers, not just on one end, let's say business or regulators, but also with all the other players within the space. Uh, in terms of some of the challenges and how we're going to, to be handling this, uh, I think uh, we, we've had some of the few challenges that have been mentioned. We've also had uh, various research from the first panel and various other discussions where we've, we've seen a series of issues that have come up. And we saw that one of the issues that have been really key has been around around capacity of consumer associations. So we realized that most of the consumer associations are, are lacking in, in terms of understanding whether digital financial services are, what channels are available, what are the policy issues around that. So one of the key things we're going to be trying to solve is enhancing the capacity of consumer associations, especially in low and middle income countries to see how they can be capacitated or given the knowledge they need to be able to push for more consumer centric design. But uh, I'll pause there for now in case in case of anything else, uh, Jayashree. No, that's, uh, it's it's great. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to turn quickly to uh, Evo, but I'm going to come back to you, Sheila, in a bit, because I have a question for you. Um, but Evo, something that Sheila just mentioned, which is, you know, the limited capacity of consumer organizations, and that's quite closely linked to resource challenges that one sees in various markets. Um, which you know raises the question of the cost angle of setting up sandboxes and what that would mean. Um, and I have a, a second unrelated question in the same breath, which is what is the role that regulatory sandboxes can play in a world where we're moving towards embedded financial services, where uh, payments and lending and insurance is now bundled with uh, providers that lie outside the remit of financial regulators, uh, you know, what can we do there? So two questions. Yeah, two big questions. Thank you, Jerry. And by the way, I just scroll down through the list of uh, attendees and I see a lot of familiar names. So it feels like a family gathering almost. So I want to say hi to all the friends that are uh, calling in. Um, let, let me actually start answering the, the second part of your question about embedded finance, which, uh, you know, at SIGA, we actually describe embedded finance as part of a broader trend of modularization. 
if, of financial services, where now we see a diversity of very specialized providers distributed across the value chain, all specialized in, in their sort of niche business and offering a very specialized services to the customers. So customers no longer go to one place to get all their financial needs uh, satisfied, be it a bank or other financial provider, but they can shop really from uh, a, a different competing organizations. And that can potentially bring benefits around cost, access, fit, and customer experience. You know, you can think of an example uh, of Shopify, an e-commerce platform that's partnered with a fintech startup uh, called, well, no more startup, I guess, Stripe, that embeds financial services in the Shopify interface. But it, it embeds not only services uh, produced by Stripe directly, but also partner organizations like Goldman Sachs and Barclays and, and others. So you are a customer of Shopify, but as you interact, you're selling products or buying products on their platform, you also get access to the financial services when you need it and where, where you need it. So this hopefully really can bring financial services closer to the customer, but also help to deliver financial services that cater to a very specific customer segments. We sometimes talk about hyper uh, hyper specialization or uh, hyper customization of financial services. So this is great and potentially very beneficial uh, for the customer outcomes as well. But as you said, there are also risks. Uh, and we heard from the previous uh, panels that there are many new emerging risks. So um, in this specific context, you know, some of the risks come from uh, the complexity of outsourcing and partnership arrangements, uh, concentration risk that some of those big platforms pose, obviously technology risk, but also traditional risks that are being magnified through the, the technology. CCAP actually conducted a research on digital credit where we found uh, you know, increasing risks um, uh, around digital credit. The, the, the research was conducted in India and Cote d'Ivoire specifically. So now tied is to the question of sandboxes. I think sandboxes can help improve the capacity of regulators to identify some of those risks and to respond to them. But I would also caution specifically in the context of uh, embedded finance, that the utility of sandbox may be limited because very often we're talking about, um, in the context of embedded finance, about businesses that are platform-based uh, with network effects and multiplicity of parties involved, all of which makes the concept of small-scale time-bound testing that is associated with sandbox perhaps a less suitable a, a solution. So. I would caution against, against that, but the good news is obviously that regulators and supervisors can use other tools, as we've heard about them, uh, other than Sandbox, to still deal with these new, new types of um, businesses, including just letting the business uh, enter the market, start scaling up, but subjected to a heightened scrutiny and using, again, maybe some of the market monitoring tools to really track exactly what the customer experience is and intervene in a timely manner. And again, we've implemented some of, or just some of those tools in places like India or Cote d'Ivoire, including the social media monitoring, where as a regulator, you can very quickly understand whether something's wrong, something wrong is happening in the market and, and intervene. Briefly, just briefly on the cost, <clears throat> we did the research or survey looking at how much it costs to launch and implement the sandbox. It was a really big range from $25,000 to over 1 million. And it really depends on how complex the uh, sandbox is, you know, how, how, what is the scale of the sandbox, also the specific circumstances such as staff, staff cost in, in a given country. <clears throat> and most commonly it's the industry who, who pays uh, for the cost through the, through the levies imposed on, on regulated firms. But what, what is important to understand in the context of cost is just, it, it, it is essential for the regulator to understand from the very beginning why Sandbox is happening, why Sandbox may bring something beneficial to the market, and then do the cost-benefit analysis and decide, you know, is it worth $25,000 or a million US dollars or, or not, depending on what the expected outcomes uh, can be. So maybe let's, let me just answer that, that uh, question briefly at this point. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for that, Ivo. And I think you you bring up a similar point that Shelley brought up earlier, which is, you know, the we need to acknowledge that all of these are tools and the tools have to be applied in the context of the problem. And it's not, you know, applying the wrong tool to the, uh, or applying 
yeah, applying a tool to any random problem is not going to give you a good outcome. So, um, but coming back to you, Sheila, because uh, you know, you've uh, also brought up this this uh, the challenge of embedded finance, which is you know several the risks that lie outside the remit of uh, financial regulators. But the other issue that we've observed in several emerging markets, which is a, which has been written about a bit now in, in media is outdated legal systems, uh, which often you know, are hard to change. And consumer associations such as Consumers International play an important role in, in you know, advocating for that. So the absence of property rights, incarceration in case of loan defaults. And we know that these laws are on the books, but how do some of the CI network partners deal with these challenges? And how do you think you will address it through the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator? Mm, thanks, Jeshree. I think uh, to speak to that, we have realized in various countries, even those that have some kind of policies or progressive policies on digital financial services, that 45% of the associations that we we surveyed felt that these were lacking or needed improvement. And I just to give an example, one of our member organizations, uh, the Confederation for Consumer, Consumer Societies in Russia, did a series of mystery shopping in, in different regions in Russia to monitor how financial institutions were treating customers. And uh, one of the mystery shopping activities was on investment, uh, in investment insurance product, products, products that were being put out by financial institutions. And these had uh, the, the data that they were giving out or when contracting with customers was very unclear. And they wouldn't tell customers, for example, that if they exit the contracts before a certain term, they wouldn't be compensated for anything. They were not exclusive in telling that. They were not clear in telling the customers that maybe there are no guarantees of profit. And as such, various people were taking on these insurance products without knowing the risks that were coming up with them. And through these activities, the CONFOP was able to provide insights to the regulators. And later, the Bank of Russia issued a standard on investment insurance products. And this goes to show you that some of the work that uh, consumer organizations do that helps uh, elevate some of these risks, which if you look at an, uh, a consumer individually, they may not have access to the places where they can actually effect change. So as part of the accelerator, a big part of our job is going to be around coordinating advocacy efforts within various uh, consumer organizations across the country, but also creating engagement opportunities, whether with regulators or policymakers or business, so that even as we, we progress, as new digital uh, products come up, that we are also keep at par, that we know what the customer is experiencing, we know what is being uh, implemented or enforced when you get down to, to interact with the customers. These are all things that the insights we're going to generate will be able to, to showcase, but also be able to have all the various stakeholders play a part in ensuring that we have a fair and a safe digital finance marketplace. But also to speak a little bit sub to what um, the work that uh, uh, Sandbox says and TechSprints are doing, they present a very excellent opportunity for uh, consumer-centric uh, policies or designing of um, products with the consumer in mind. So instead of waiting later on to come and solve some of these issues, these present a very uh, good platform where we can have the consumer voice at the center of the design, at the center of enhancing policies, at the center of changing processes, and later on, we all move as one towards a common goal. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Sheila. And I'm, I'm being prompted that we might be running out of time. So I have one final question to all the panelists. Uh, I can go on asking questions, but I think we're also receiving a lot of questions on chat. So, you know, let me give them. But a, a quick rapid fire round for all of you, which is what is your advice for, you know, our audience, which comprises today of regulators, consumer advocacy groups, and other stakeholder groups, really, who are looking to improve consumer outcomes? Um, you know, from where, from the work that you're doing and from your point of view, what is, what is the one piece of advice that you have for them? And you each have one minute. So I'm going to um, go with, ask Shelly to go first, Sheila, and then Evo. 
Um, so I think, um, you know, from my point of view and, and how to, uh, regulators could potentially get, bridge the gap using text sprints, I think, and I've mentioned a couple of these is, you know, look at the bigger picture of what a text sprint could provide to you. So, you know, you may not end up with tangible solutions, but what else are you getting from it? Richer understanding of the challenges, the barriers, the opportunities, understanding that technology more. Um, I know I've mentioned that in terms of sandboxes getting close to the technology that is out there and understanding how it's being applied and how it could be applied is really important. And secondly, how you create an ecosystem around this, you know, bringing in that consumer voice, whether that's consumer advocates or consumers themselves, but applying those to the problems and really understanding what you're trying to solve for will give, will give you such a rich learning. Um, and finally, I'd say, you know, it's, it's, Text prints will give you an understanding of the real issues. So understand from a consumer centric point of view what you're trying to solve for. And then you can apply a text print to that. And I think you will get, um, you'll accelerate your learnings and your the richness if, if you do that. Thanks, Shelley. Sheila? Yes, I think for me, I would say, I would, I would say systemically involving the regular, uh, consumer voice, whether through consumer associations, consumer representatives in various design and policy setting processes so that as we go ahead now and beyond various projects, the consumer voice is always at the center of the different design, but also holding each other accountable to some of the promises or the things we set out to do, whether it's business or uh, the policymakers, holding them account each other accountable to the promises that we make to consumers. Thanks, Sheila and Ivo. All right. Well, so I, I don't feel confident enough to give regulators, uh, you know, advice in such a difficult uh, context. But I am not shy to raise uh, maybe a philosophically, fundamentally practical question uh, to to regulators and policymakers. You know, should they in specifically in markets ripe for major upgrades, for example, where instant payments are still not available? You know, should they worry about niche initiatives such as regulatory sandbox or, I don't know, even open banking or CBDCs, or should they really focus their attention to making those major improvements in the system which can benefit uh, uh, many customers? And we know that from the previous uh, experience, you know, in, 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 uh, in other words, you know, if you have limited resources, you know, should you dedicate them to many of those uh, specialized initiatives or maybe focus on a big picture as as, um, as Shelley was kind of alluding to as well. And if I am actually to provide some advice or maybe a recommendation, then it would be go to cgap.org slash sandbox and there you will find a lot more about when a regulatory sandbox is a suitable solution, how it may help to improve the customer outcomes. Thanks, Ivo. Um, I'm going to, there are a few questions in the chat. So one of the questions that's been raised here is, how does the regulator setting up sandboxes handle a modularized financial service setup? And I think they're asking from the point of view that uh, from a risk perspective, the service as a standalone is good uh, because it leads to positive consumer outcomes, but when integrated into an ecosystem, it might magnify risks. Um, and I don't know if either you or uh, Shelley would like to address that. I, I could just brief, briefly sort of uh, reiterate the, the point that I uh, mentioned before that uh, for embedded finance, because of the involvement in, of multiple parties, um, I don't think that we see much of regulatory sandbox testing apl applied to that specific use case because sandbox, I think initially was really envisioned as a small scale rapid time bound uh, way to test uh, a single solution by a single, single provider. Um, Again, I think for those platform-based or embedded finance-based uh, business models and solutions, uh, regulators may, may be um, better off if they either try to regulate them up front, so analyzing where the risks are and then coming up with a regulatory response to them, or uh, and, and then tweaking the regulatory response by just observing and monitoring how that innovation in, interacts and evolves in the marketplace. But I am personally rather skeptical that 
you know, embedded finance can be easily promoted through the sandbox testing. But that's that's more my personal view than really anything based on the research that I've done. Yeah, I'm, I'd, I'd agree. And I'd also, you know, point out that with sandboxes or any tool, the, the, the goal is to reduce risk. It's not to completely eradicate it. So, you know, if you can identify, you know, risk at the, the outset that's that's brilliant but there are always going to be things that are gonna going to have to go into real world environments before you spot them um so you know from a uk point of view we've we've got things in our regulatory toolkit such as you know um our um uh, you know how you should treat consumers so you know our code of conduct for consumers you can overlay that onto every, every, everything that you do and, and it becomes something that everyone has to be mindful of when they're designing things. So, you know, I would say that, you know, sandbox do have their limitations and, and, and when something is multi-layered, you may not catch everything and, and it may, you know, it may go into the, into the real world before you catch it, but that's what the rest of the regulatory toolkit is there for as well. Yeah, thank you. I think also to jump in, that's where the consumer organizations come in because all the things we fail to catch are later things that come up as we we pass on the product to the consumers. So you'll find that maybe what we design for various consumers does not answer the solution for another group of consumers. So this is where then we come in to provide the required insights and feedback to help. Yeah. And actually, uh, Sheila, staying on the consumer associations and some of the challenges that um, that you face, you know, because it's it's been written about, and we know that uh, you know capacity constraints and resource constraints tend to be uh, challenges. I wonder if you know some of your work in the accelerator is going to explore uh, business models or you know newer ways in which these resource constraints for consumer groups can be uh, can be addressed yes i think particularly for resource constraints for some of those countries where we see the uh, big policy issues or digital finance issues that they are actively working on the accelerator will be providing sub grants to some of our members so if there is a pressing issue we shall be able to see where to prioritize and provide sub grants to support with uh, advocating for some of these changes in some of the locations And I see one question here, which is uh, risk monitoring, which is it's a great question, which is, you know, have, have you all seen models where consumer organizations and supervisors and regulators are collaborating with each other? Certainly in the UK, um, there is a constant dialogue with with key consumer organizations. So, you know, the, there's a there's a whole uh, division devoted to kind of ensuring that we've got um, a, a clear understanding of what the consumer organizations are seeing. So, um, you know, I don't think regulators can um, monitor, monitor risk um, effectively in, in a silo. Um, so there is a lot of reliance of those people that are on the ground. Um, and certainly tools, as I say, things, things like text prints and things like that can surface some of that as well. Um, as I say, we, we've uh, in the UK we we did a tech sprint around uh, mental health, and actually what what surfaced was um, a, a concern around um, how data might be misused rather than how it can be used for good, and it sort of led off to a different kind of view of of how we might tackle um, the use of data for vulnerability. So. I, you know, I think I, I, I've only ever worked in the UK uh, regulator, but certainly there is a close collaboration and, and a constant dialogue between um, a regulator and, and consumer organisations to ensure that they try to spot things before they crystallise. Well, I can take an unusual turn here and just call on my colleague Eric Dufo, who's in, in the attendance and who's written excessively with another colleague, Juan Carlos Zagiri, on the topic of market monitoring. So I invite Eric to respond to that <laughs> question on, on, on my behalf in, in, in the chat because there's some great work coming out of that research. Yeah, indeed. And I think Eric is coming on later. So I'm hoping that you know he'll touch a little bit about that. Um, and yes, Eric, please, please do respond on chat as well. But a, a quick question to um to Sheila and Shelley, both of you, which is, you know, consumer organizations uh 
uh, often need to find their way into these channels or into these fora where problems are raised. And for you, when you're organizing text prints at, uh, you know, at AIR or in, particularly in markets where this dialogue may not be systematized, how do you make sure that, uh, you know, that, that it's, it's formalized and that you identify the right set of people? How do you go about it? Um, so it goes back to the ecosystem. Um, you know, there's some there's some huge organisations out there that are best placed to reach into the communities and reach into the right people. So from the very outset, when we when we design a tech sprint, you know, we would work with um, CGAP, uh, Women's um, World Banking, the World Bank. You know. It, it, people that have already got networks and already got those um, relationships in place to then identify who should be invited to the table, who should be part of this conversation. And it's not who should be invited to this conversation in six months time when we, you know, roll out a tech sprint. It's who should be invited to this conversation at the very outset to say, you know, what is the problem we're solving for and, and how are we going to approach that? What are the problem statements? What are the use cases? Um, so that is actually a really fundamental part of, um, of tech sprints. And as I say, in some cases, it might be that re the regulators are already in contact with those consumer organizations or community groups or uh, et cetera. In other cases, we might work with, as I say, more global organizations and consumer organizations that have got, uh, have got those, reg uh, the, those existing relationships, but it's not perfect. And, you know, one thing about tech sprints is we do go out publicly and we do, Kind of rely on the net, you know, the power of the network to kind of tell people this is happening, and you, you know, you you do get people contacting you and saying, "I've just seen this on LinkedIn, or I've just seen this through a, a, a mutual contact, and I've got this expertise, and I, I feel like I should be involved." So it is, it's a bit organic, but that's how that's how we would do it for a text room. Is uh, for consumers international usually we do have some networks in place, for example, with the UNTA, the World Economic Forum, we collaborate with CGAP and various, uh, with the donors and various partners, but also we realize that sometimes the consumer associations may need to get into new spaces. So being in forums like this one, uh, working with various partners gives us an opportunity to speak about our work, but also to hear what other players are doing to see how we can collaborate. And currently we are really still building. So we invite anyone who's interested in working with us to please reach out. We are still building. We want to see which channels can work. We're still exploring to see what works best. So yeah, we are happy to, to partner with anyone who's interested in our work. Great. And there are some great resources that are being posted in the chat as well. Um, there is a question which you know we, we touched upon very briefly on how sandboxes and text prints are resource and capacity intensive and you know are there alternate tools that can be used in low capacity environments okay well i can again uh go first so um there are tools that are either alternative or or complementary or even exclusive to regulatory sandbox and we mentioned some of them but generally there's this whole category of innovation facilitators that would cover things like fintech offices, uh, accelerators, and, and other initiatives, either set up directly by regulators or in partnerships with private sector or purely private sector driven. Um, and many of them require far less resources than, than regulatory sandbox and can handle much higher level of, uh, much higher number of inquiries from the industry. So for example, fintech office, you know, it's a relatively low resource uh, initiative, but can help regulators to engage in a dialogue with many different entities. Um, Sandbox is uh, resource intensive because it requires a staff time on the side of the regulator to work with the innovators for an extended period of time throughout the testing to help to set up the test, to monitor the test, to evaluate the results and to decide on, on the final response. Now. It may be necessary where regulator feels like the evidence is needed to make a qualified informed decision about how to respond to particle innovation. And that evidence can only come from the live testing of innovation. But that is really just a, a very small portion of instances and many other instances. It is the dialogue that helps regulator to inform the, the, the decision um, and engagement. So, so I would say 
you may not see it necessarily as an alternative tools or but more like a, again toolkit or scale of things that you can do to get where you want to be which is having a conducive or framework that is conducive to uh, a beneficial uh, innovation so i would that would be my answer you know think a bit of, of it as a portfolio and depending on your resources but i would say say one more thing which is in our research we kind of look at um what are the factors that are determining the appropriate design of regulatory sandbox and that kind of uh hints to the question of capacity because we found that it is the market structure and demand that you see for such a solution in, in your specific market. It is obviously the legal and regulatory framework, and it is the capacity, you as a regulator, but also of the market to absorb and, and meaningfully use that, uh, that, that tool. So you need to look into those three, we call them threshold constraints, and then decide you know, what it is that you actually need and have resources for, if that makes sense. And I think um, a similar vein um, in, in the tech sprint world, I think people think that the FCA have always run tech sprints with 200 people and across five days. But actually, the first tech sprint that um, the, the FCA um, held was just three teams. I think it was 40 people in a room. It was very small. Um, it was very focused. Um, it didn't have bells and whistles or conferences or anything like that. Um, and in fact, over the years, the FCA, FCA have used what I, what we would call a highly leveraged model. So there are often players within the ecosystem that would support things, um, consultancies, things like that. You have to think about your, you know, obviously your competition rules and stuff like that. But there's there are ways to kind of leverage other people's resources. Um, RBIH worked with a number of partners for their one. So they had... Um, some consultancies helping them with problem statements. They had um, an accelerator program that they they leveraged as well. So thinking about how you can you can leverage what's available to you outside and in the ecosystem. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that you don't necessarily have to run a tech sprint yourself. So often there are tech sprints going on around the globe that are on specific subjects. And actually just being a participant in that would give you some experience and some learnings and knowledge that you can, you know, you can at least take away. Um, and something, you know, the, the goal for AIR and, and what we want to do is do more regionalized um, tech sprints where we would have, you know, multiple regulators involved and, and, and supporting them from a regional point of view so that, you know, that there's less, less burden on, on resources. But um, as I say, the FCA itself had a very small core team. Um, I think at the beginning, I was one of three and then it was it went up to seven um but we were running quite big programs so i think you know understanding what it does actually take to run a tech sprint is also important because i think you can scale up and scale down and still see you know good outcomes um from whatever you choose to do i have one more question in about a minute i think but um there's a, a question on how can all the panelists comment on how the tools that you've mentioned can promote competition in a way that is beneficial to consumers? And you know, referring back to the case of Safaricom, which Amrit brought up in the previous panel. Um, at the FCA, we used to cite uh, technology and our innovation program as one of our key tools for driving competition. So, um, you know. It makes sense to us that if we can facilitate and support more um, solutions into the into the ecosystem, that it would drive better better outcomes for consumers. So it it was actually you know when we looked across at how we could link what we were doing with the FCA's actual outcomes, it was competition that was <laughs> that was the lead the lead in that. Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, incumbents have got huge resources, they've got access to data, um, they've got, um, you know, ecosystems already in place, whereas small um, fintechs, regtechs and subtechs don't have that. So, again, our innovation program was around giving them the tools and helping support them with the tools that they need to be able to I, you know, I scale up or, you know, increase and, and particularly I would say around the data point. So the FCA have created a digital sandbox um, now, which is purely about 
creating data sets so that people can move from proof of concept to proof of value because what we found was you know startups and and, and small scale um, solutions just don't have access to the data that they need to either train their models or test their models and 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 and, and things like that so for us competition absolutely run through the veins of of what innovate of, of what the innovation innovation approach was at the fca i can just see jay uh you know um now doing a, a, a different project from sandbox and there is an anecdotal evidence it's focused on emerging business models and digital financial services and digitization of uh, microfinance and i'm talking to a lot of people in, in different markets and i'm hearing a very consistent story you know when fintechs and and sort of more agile providers come and start doing things that are more convenient to customers and customers start moving from incumbents incumbents respond and so we've seen for example uh, a lowering of interest rates in some markets in response or providers seriously thinking about dynamic pricing for credit that is really based on uh, a, a more detailed segmentation than what incumbents are used to and, and, and the same would probably apply to things like, uh, you know, better savings accounts or cheaper payment services. So if regulators extend the regulatory hands to the innovators and offer them, you know, a little bit more guidance in sort of exchange of implicit promise that those innovations will not neglect the excluded and, and underserved segments, then we may see the long-term effect being that even incumbents will try to move in that space and serve those segments that have been neglected for a long time. So that's that's the theory, and now it's becoming a practice in some markets too. Uh, in our case, it wouldn't be uh, competition in the traditional sense of the word, but it would be mostly through showcasing best practices, like which regulators and policymakers in which countries are more consumer-centric, which ones are listening to the insights of uh, customer, consumer organizations and implementing the changes that are being requested, and even business. If there are businesses that are progressively and consistently putting the consumer first, then would be showcasing some of their, of their achievements in various case studies and through the different forums that we shall be in. It, um, thank you all. I mean, I think I can go on asking questions, but we're at, at the close of our session. Um, I do hope that we can continue these conversations on LinkedIn. And if I haven't answered any questions, then, you know, we'll continue there. I think overall, I'm left with a positive story. There are some knowledge gaps, but, you know, there is there is some hope in using technology and seeing um, at least anecdotal evidence. So that's, you know, something that we should move towards as a community, I think, to, um, to address. And, and, yeah, putting the consumer at the heart is, is the message. So thank you for your time.